All right, you guys, let's get into some descriptive statistics. Let's begin chapter two by talking about frequency distributions and how the heck we're going to graph these things. All right, so what is a frequency distribution? A frequency distribution is going to be a table that shows classes or intervals of data with a count or tally of the number of entries in each class. For example, I could read this table on the right as between 1 and 5, we have 5 entries. Between 6 and 10, we have 8 entries. And so we're just tallying some data that we have. The frequency of a class is the number of data entries in that class. So 5 is the frequency in the class of 1 to 5. 8 is the frequency in the class of 6 to 10. Okay, just continuing on here with some vocabulary. These left-hand numbers in the class, the 1, 6, 11, 16, 21, and 26, are referred to as lower class limits. And conversely, the 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, these right-hand uh, numbers of the intervals, are going to be the upper class limits. And occasionally, I'm going to ask you to calculate the class width. To calculate the class width, you simply subtract two adjacent lower class limits. So in this situation, we would take 6 minus 1 to get the class width of 5. But note we could use any of our lower class limits so long as they're um, adjacent. So we could do 16 minus 11, and once again, we get the class width of 5. All right, how do we go about constructing a frequency distribution? Step one of the recipe is we want to decide on the number of classes. I will usually give this to you. I will ask you uh, to construct a frequency distribution with say five classes or eight classes. Um, but if you have to decide on your own, typically we say let's, let's shoot for between five and 20. Obviously 20 is gonna be more um, in a situation where we have a ton of data. All right, then we want to find the class width. All right, so how do we go about finding the class width? We're going to determine the range of the data. So we're going to get our, our maximum data point minus our minimum data point. And we're going to divide the range by the number of classes. So we're going to divide the range by the number we got in part one. All right, if you get a decimal, all right, you're going to round up to the next number. All right, I'm going to say it one more time so you don't forget. If you get a decimal when you're getting the class width, round up to the next number. All right, third in the recipe, we want to find the class limits. All right, we can use the minimum data entry as the lower limit of the first class. So in other words, we just start with our smallest number, and then we're going to find the remaining lower limits by adding the class width to the lower limit of the preceding class. So again, start with that minimum data number and then just add your class width to it. We're going to then find the upper limit of the first class. All right, this is important, guys. And I'm going to let me grab my marker here. Maybe. Classes cannot overlap. Okay. So, since classes can't overlap, we're just going to make sure that the next lower limit does not cross the previous upper limit. And this will all make sense once we get into an example. All right, step four, we're going to make a tally mark for each data entry in the row of the appropriate class. So, we're just, we're just going to count um, the frequencies here. We're just going to go through our data and figure out which class or interval they belong in. All right, and then lastly, we're going to count our tally marks to find the total frequency for each class. Okay, so let's actually do this with an example, and I promise you it's not going to sound as convoluted as it does when you try to explain it. All right, so here we have a sample data set that lists the prices of 30 portable GPS nav navigators. Okay, so we've got 30 portable GPS navigators and we want to construct a frequency distribution that has seven classes. Okay, so step one, what's the number of classes? That's seven. Again, I gave it to you. Right now we need to get the, the class width. How are we going to do so? 
We're going to look through our data and find our maximum value, which is 450. And we're also going to look through our data and find our minimum value, which is 59. The difference between the maximum and minimum is 391. So we take that range and we divide it by the number of classes, which is 7, and we get approximately 55.86. Now what do we do when we get a decimal? You got it. We always round up to the next number. And so we round up here to 56. So 56 is going to be our class width. All right, so now we need our lower limits. We're starting with our minimum value in our data of 59, and we're adding 56 to 59. When we add 56 to 59, we get 115. We continue to do this, all right, until we get to the seventh lower limit. So to 115, we add 56, and we get 171. To 171, we add 56 to get 227, and so forth. All right, now we need the upper limits. So how am I going to get the upper limits? Well, the key here is that we can't overlap our lower limits. So we're going to take, we're going to take one off our lower limit of 115 to get our first upper limit of 114. Similarly, we're going to take one off 171 and get our second upper limit of 170. We're going to take one off 227 and get our third upper limit of 226. Okay, and so here we're calculating our lower limits and our upper limits. Notice that the class width stays the same. If we subtract two adjacent upper limits, we also get our class width of 56. This is a great check to make sure you're doing it right. All right, finally here we want to go through our data and make a tally mark for each data entry in the row of the appropriate class. So here, and I'm going to skip back here for a second, we're going to go back to our data set here and let's just take for example our first number is 90. And so 90 would give us this tick mark right here between 59 and 114. We do this for all of our data. We then add our tick marks, all right, and we get our frequencies. And guys, this should have a bar here. All right, so we have five entries between 59 and 114. Eight portable GPS navigators are priced between $115 and $170, and so forth. All right, what if we want to calculate the midpoint? Now those of you that are coming from college algebra better remember how to calculate a midpoint. All we do is we add our lower class limit and our upper class limit and divide it by 2. And so for our first midpoint, we'd add 59 and 114 and divide it by 2 to get 86.5. We continue to do this for each class. And notice if you do it right, your class width should stay the same of 56. And we can double check that. We take 142.5, subtract it from 86.5, and we see that our class width stays the same at 56. All right, so what about the relative frequency of a class? How would we go about calculating that? Well, relative frequency means the percentage of the data that falls in a particular class. So we need to calculate a percentage or a decimal all right, and how do we do that? Guys, it's really easy. All you do for each class is you take the frequency and divide it by the number of data entries that you have, or the sample size. So we know that we're looking at 30 GPS navigators. And so for our first class here, we'd simply take 5, which is our frequency, divide it by 30, and get approximately 0.17. So what does that say? It means 17% of the GPS navigators are priced between $59 and $114. Similarly, in our next class, we have 8 divided by 30 
which tells us that 27% of the portable GPS navigators are priced between $115 and $170. All right, we also sometimes want to look at something called a cumulative frequency, okay? So cumulative, you know from usually final exams, means everything, all right? And so we're adding it up. We're accumulating our frequencies. So notice, let me grab my pen here, notice our first cumulative frequency matches our first frequency of five. But to get our next cumulative frequency, we're gonna add it to the frequency between 115 and 170, which is eight. And so we get our second cumulative frequency of 13. So again, five plus eight gives us 13. Similarly, 13 plus six gives us 19. And so you see that we're adding our frequencies up along the way. All right, and so here is everything we've talked about. We made our classes for our GPS navigators. All right, so between $59 and $114, we found five GPS navigators. The midpoint of the class we, ca we calculated, we talked about getting adding 114 to 59 and dividing by two to get the midpoint. The relative frequency came from taking the frequency of the class and dividing it by the sample size. And the cumulative frequency comes from adding the frequencies. So again, we start with five, then we add eight, then we add six, then we add five, and so forth. Two things that are super important you're gonna make sure to remember is that your frequencies have to add up to your sample size. That's number one. Your frequencies have to add up to your sample size, and your relative frequencies have to add up to one. Two things that are super important. I will be testing you on them. The frequencies have to add up to your sample size and the relative frequencies have to add up to one. Okay, so let's talk about a frequency histogram. Let's talk about graphing these things. All right, usually we're gonna use a bar graph. The horizontal scale is quantitative, okay, and measures the data values. So in this situation, it would be our uh, prices of the GPS navigators. And our vertical scale measures the frequencies. Okay, so again, the x-axis is our data, the y-axis is our frequencies. Okay, and again, consecutive bars much, must touch. We're not gonna put a space between them when they're consecutive. Okay, so how do we go about calculating the class boundaries? We, we've talked about classes, and we've talked about class width and the midpoint, but now we need to talk about the boundaries. The numbers that separate classes without forming gaps between them. Okay, so this is our definition of class boundaries. In other, in other words, we're just gapping the space that, between, but that exists right now between our classes. Okay, so the distance from the upper limit of the first class to the lower limit of the second class was 115 minus 114, or one, meaning we gapped one dollar between our classes. Half this distance is 0.5, right? So again, I get the distance from the consecutive upper limit of the first class and the lower limit of the second class. I divide it in half, and I'm gonna use this to get my boundaries. So I'm basically gonna take 0.5 off the lower limit, and I'm gonna add 0.5 to the upper limit. And so you can see where now my class boundary for the first class is 58.5 to 114.5. All right, let me grab my pen one second. All right, let's go ahead and do the second class boundary. We'd have 114.5, to 170.5. All right, notice there's no gap now between our classes thanks to these boundaries. Okay, and so here's our table with all of our class boundaries listed. Again, you can see there's no gaps now.
Okay, and so we want to construct a frequency histogram now, given our classes, our class boundaries, and our frequencies. Okay, so let's talk about our histogram. Again, the width is 56 of the bars. All right, our class boundaries allow our bars to touch. On my x-axis, I happen to have used the midpoints, and that just gives us um, an idea of how our data is labeled. Notice here in pink, the broken axis. Why would I do that? Well, I don't want this big open space on my graph between 0 and 55, 50, well, 58.5. All right, so this starts right here at 58.5. I don't want to see a big space between 0 and 58.5. So I can use that little broken part of my axis to just denote that I'm skipping a bunch of empty space. There's no data below, below 58.5. Okay, and so then using, how do I graph? I'm just graphing the frequencies in each class. So that's where the five, the eight, and the six come from. Graphing the frequencies. Okay, and so similarly here, instead of labeling with my midpoints, you can see here I'm labeling with my class boundaries. It's really up to you. I may specifically ask you to do one or the other, so you need to be aware of both. Okay, and then we have the relative frequency histogram. It's the same thing, but this time, instead of putting the actual frequencies on the y-axis, we're gonna put the relative frequencies on the y-axis. Okay, so we can go back to our frequency distribution. We can grab our relative frequencies for each class, and we can now plot or, or, or graph the relative frequencies. That's all that's changing between a frequency histogram and a relative frequency histogram. So let me summarize that one more time for you guys. If I ask you for a frequency histogram, your y-axis is going to be the count within the classes or the frequency. If I ask you for a relative frequency histogram, your, your y-axis is going to be the decimals or percentages of the relative frequency. Okay, so, and I may ask you something simple like, um, how do you interpret this relative frequency histogram? And just a simple example, uh, we can see from this graph, 27% of the GPS navigators are priced between $114.50 and $170.50.